He is the author of The Red Neck, Neck Manifesto, and he has a new book out called Whiteness, The Original Sin. Hey, Jim, welcome to the show. Amazing. 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 <laughs> Sorry about the, um, um, Sorry. the slow start there. Jim, explain to us what do you mean when you say uh, whiteness being the original sin? Can you see me and hear me? I see you hear you loud now, Jim. All this well. <laughs> Uh, personally, you uh, you came up in Gary, Indiana. You lived in Gary, Indiana for a while. Yes. God, wow, amazing, and you but survived. I, that's, but I that's grew like up one of the most terrifying places I've ever <laughs> you, seen in my life. You can say that's, that again. That's hardcore. I, it was easier for me growing up in Alabama on a plantation under the Jim Crow law than it was to grow up to live in Gary, Indiana. That's kind of the case, though, isn't it? Uh, aren't all the northern ghettos much rougher than any place in the south? I mean, I live in the Atlanta area now. Yes. And I've never seen people get along better than they do here. That's is, right. It's, that's not what you expect. Absolutely. But anyway, as far as whiteness goes, I'm a white boy from Clifton Heights, Pennsylvania. My dad was a plumber. Uh, he was kind of irreligious. My mom was Catholic. We grew up with nothing but Italians and Irish. And uh, I, you know, working class, I went to school, went to journalism school, and I started working around white people at the Los Angeles Reader. And I noticed uh, this was back in the 80s. They had endless compassion. This was when, like, they were doing all these benefits for the rainforest and the Amazon. And they were crying tears about the Amazonian rainforest Indians. But if some white trash in uh, Riverside, California just happened to all die because they lived in a trailer park that was over a toxic waste dump. They thought it was hilarious. And I just tried to figure out why that was. And the first time I got married, it was a Reverend Walker Goat in Las Vegas in a trailer park. And I asked him, where, where did the first goats, like, how did they get to America? He said we were convict laborers and indentured servants. I was like, wow, that's not the story I was told. I was told I was a slave owner and I should feel guilty about it. And so for the Redneck Manifesto, I just, I did a history of poor white people in America. And as far as I can tell, they only started importing black slaves when the white slaves started dying in the heat or proved a little too rebellious. And it was actually easier to identify black slaves because you look at the you look at some of the documents from the 1600s. They called them slaves. And there was a whole a whole like racket in kidnapping poor British children, knocking them over the head, knocking them unconscious, bringing them here, working them to death. They say it was a lot different than slavery. It wasn't. Like, half of them never lasted the seven years. About a third of them died on the way over. It's like, huh, well, that's why, so why am I getting blamed for all this stuff? And it, it occurred to me a few years ago, the big theme in my writing is guilt projection. The people who made money on the slave trade were rich whites, but they found a way to blame the poor whites for it. And that's all I've ever I've been about since. It's like not wanting to take any, I'll take blame for stuff I'm responsible for, but not an inch beyond that. I think white people, why right now? I mean, you're talking about the Vikings, 1000 AD. They weren't like white people are now. This is, you know, a gradual process. Uh, white people, I think, got fat and lazy and soft. And propaganda is effective, too. I mean, they've heard for generations they're responsible for everything wrong. And they know the consequences of saying, no, I'm not. You get called a Nazi. You get you lose your job. A lot of them are scared. I don't know if they're going to have to get hungrier or more scared, but uh, that's that's where we are now. We have a system, and this is what I wrote about in the Redneck book, encouraging poor whites and blacks to be mad at each other and to blame each other. Because welfare, in a way, or affirmative action, yeah, that takes away stuff from poor whites. It doesn't take away anything from rich whites. So it's kind of a little race war that's set up by the elites, or at least that's the way I see it. Yeah. But uh, white people— there, there are some white are. nationalist types who think that whites have an, a genetic defect where they're just too altruistic and they're too caring of people who aren't like them. I don't think that's the case. Like I said, Vikings, Vikings are a whole different type of white person. I think it's we've come this way through a long historical process. And so white people are helping their enemies to destroy them because of white guilt and, and they're afraid guilt, of losing yeah. jobs and all that? I think guilt, I said this before, it was Mao Zedong who said that uh, all political power comes at the end of a gun barrel. I think that's true to some degree, but I think guilt is a huge weapon. I mean, it's always, isn't it a coincidence that the good guys always win the war and the bad guys 
always lose. You can disable somebody. You can demoralize somebody just by making them feel lousy about themselves. I mean, I, I use this analogy, too. I'm sure you're familiar with You knew who Step and Fetch It was, right? I didn't know who he was, but I've been called that, so I know. <laughs> I well, he was not like a, a good he was a thing. black actor like in the nineties. Yes, Mass Oh and yeah. Was Mantan, Mantan Moreland with the bug eyes. Oh yeah, that's okay. right. Now when black people were just apologizing, that wasn't attractive. It's not attractive in anybody. But I guess like at that point there was so much power arrayed against them, they kind of had to apologize or they get wiped out. And that's kind of it's a weird situation because it's a majority population. I don't know if this has happened in world history. They've been convinced they suck. When um, there was a, 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 a show called Amos and, and Andy. Oh, yeah. And, and the uh, black people in those days, they had no problem with Amos and Andy. They were funny. They were comedians. And it was right. something nice to watch on TV. And now the bra blacks have been so brainwashed that uh, they, they see Amos and Andy as Stephen Fetching, Stephen Fetching, rather than appreciating that. Blacks were able to do their things thing even back then. Well, they were white white actors who did Amos and Andy, actually. But no, I, well, I, it was two black men. I don't remember the white one. I'm pretty sure the voice, the people who did the voices, by I could be wrong. Yeah. But uh, I write about this in the Redneck Manifesto too, because you, you look at the stereotypes of black then, and I guess they're very condescending, but they are kind of they're not malevolent. You don't have rapists and murderers as blacks. You have them just happy-go-lucky and you know enjoying their. And they kind of had that with stereotypes of poor whites, like Little Abner and the Beverly Hillbillies. Oh, look at these dumb, lovable. Sometime in the mid-60s, the stereotypes of poor whites got sinister. It became like deliverance. And they're going to rape you and every killer and de depraved person in the media was some poor white guy. And as somebody whose dad was a plumber, it's like, well, that's kind of a, You talk about privilege. I never really enjoyed any as far as I can tell. And but I think propaganda is effective, and, and endlessly, if you if you see that your entire history is something to be ashamed of, and you you have your life ruined if you don't go along with that, most people are conformists, and they're going to go along with that. I think that with Amos and Andy, uh, maybe when they moved to TV, it was black men because it was literally black men doing it. Okay. But uh, I got to ask, uh, what is what is a redneck? There's a whole, I mean, I, I wanted to call just the, the book Redneck. They said Redneck Manifesto. I'm like, sure. I mean, I guess a more encompassing term is white trash. But when I was researching this book, I found out across the world, every culture has a stereotype for rural idiots. Even the term pagan, back in Roman times, pagus is the Latin term for country. That's somebody, a country dweller or heathen. That was somebody who lived out in the woods in the heath. And in, even in Canada on message boards, the people on the coast of Canada would talk about people in Saskatchewan, other oh, rednecks. Now, some people say it was, a, it was some battle of some Blair Mountain, I think, in West Virginia, where the coal miners wore red bandanas. As far as I can tell, it's just a Southerner who wasn't a plantation owner. He got his neck red by having to work out in the sun, too. Right. Uh, I mean, it's an attitude. And so, I mean, I never claimed to be a redneck. I claimed to come from the white working class, and that's about it. And it's not nothing to be feel fantastic or horrible about. That's where I take it. It's like I'm not going to feel bad for where I came from. Were uh, you were you considered white trash growing up? Not not in my neighborhood because everybody was kind of working class. Yeah. You know, it's only when you go to college. Th this is a story I always tell. My brother Johnny is 13 years older than me. 1967, he was like 20. He went to Temple University, tried to go to college, and he's this Catholic kid from a brick row home in, in suburban Philly. He sees all the hippies, and the, he got overwhelmed. He chose to go to Vietnam instead. It was only when I started going to college and seeing more elite whites that I realized I was not considered part of them, and I was actually, like, spat upon and, and considered inferior by people like that. Amazing. When you see <laughs> white young men... Uh, I, I think we all know that white males are under attack. All men are hated, but white males are hated more because in America, uh, if they can get rid of the white man, they can turn America into a socialist society. They can destroy America. And so when you see white males giving in to the name calling, getting angry about it, 
and going out doing crazy things rather than speaking up and then getting involved, you know, becoming running for school boards or or, or superintendents and police department and running for president and Congress rather than overcoming and take, you know, getting into a position where they can keep things going, but rather than getting angry and just complaining and, and causing things to get worse for them. Because I'm being called all kind of names all the time. Uncle Tom, sell out, cool, you hate your color, you hate your people and all that. But I don't care because I love what's right. I love my country. When you see white males giving in to the name calling and just becoming angry and complaining and giving up, what goes through your mind? Do you mean complaining about the stereotypes against them? Or? Uh, yeah, complaining about the stereotypes, complaining about the, I mean, the war against them, rather than fighting back in the right way by getting involved and never mind the name calling. You know, stand up and be a man. What goes through your mind when you see there's, that? I mean, I guess there's different. It's like a bee colony. Different bees have different. I mean, I'm a writer, so I write about. I have to write about these contradictions and point them out. Um, yeah, nobody likes somebody complaining about it. We're in a we're in an environment now, and this is something I brought up in the Redneck book too. Pe scapegoating. People need a bad guy. It used to be blacks. Used to be Jews. Why can't we just get rid of the scapegoating? The minute all that stopped, white guys became the bad guy. It's almost like humans need the outsider, somebody to point fingers at. Like, yeah, on one hand, complaining about it's not going to get you anywhere. People are going to call you whiny. Yeah. I, I mean, there are concrete things you can do if you care about, uh, do you know about the replacement theory? That's what motivated this guy in El Paso, that uh, he thinks there's a deliberate program to demographically replace white people with non-whites. If you're worried about that, have babies, I guess. Have white babies. I've been telling them to get married and have a truckload of white babies. <laughs> yeah, my mom was one of 11. Right on. <laughs> and um, I, and so do you agree with me rather than – because I have to honestly tell you, I'm not accustomed to, to seeing men complain like little women. You know, like, beta males, you know, they see a challenge and they deal with it, overcome it. They don't withdraw into the corner and just right. point fingers and blame everyone because you have this battle of good and evil, right versus wrong. And men are hating. It. It's just the way it is right now. And they want to destroy man because they want evil to take over. And I'm a Joel, what are you doing over there? I'm accustomed to men take you know, standing up. So what do you and the I white think, I mean White men I mean, are blaming you know, complaining and whining is female and emotional, but I think facts and logic are pretty masculine. And uh, what I do as a writer, you hear, you hear that it was like Don Lemon on CNN. He said it's a verified Beta. fact. Yeah, he said he said it's a verified fact that most terrorists, most terrorist murders are by white males. So I looked up, I looked up the facts. Even the thing he cited. It had like Muslims that killed 119 in America and white or extreme rightists, which doesn't mean white males, had killed 106. It's like, nah, you're wrong. Yeah. When they say most most serial killers are white, it's like not according to the FBI. When they say most child molesters or rapists, it's like, no, here's the facts. Here's what the FBI uniform crime reports. Say. You know, racial rape statistics. And, you know, when they stopped taking those, when Obama came into office because they were so horrifyingly lopsided. Obama and Eric Holder stopped counting the perpetrators by race. Up until then, I looked at the PDFs of uniform crime reports for the previous 13 years. A white woman was 65 times, not percent, times, more likely to be raped by a non-white than a And you hear about still is Emmett Till. And so, yeah, I understand your point about complaining and whining, do something constructive. But at the same time, facts are manly. Facts are masculine. It's like, the whole narrative you're spinning is based on lies, and I think it's it's effective to to fight it on that on that angle it, from it, that angle too. It should be you write facts. The true facts are important, and because of the true facts, that should be an encouragement to stand up and and do it the right way. Because you know these people are lying, and they are lying to deceive you and control you. You know, Jim, we have a problem with your Skype. I can't even see you now. Tell the folks, and I'm going to have you back. Uh, this is me and History Mind. I definitely want to have you back. Tell the folks how to get your book and get to your site, and I'll have you back. Oh, we lost him completely? Oh, man.
We lost Jim. Let me see what I have it here. We got to just have to have it back. I can't do it anymore today. Jim Gold, G O A D dot net. Jim Gold, not dot net. Check it out, folks. You will not be disappointed. 